Good to see you guys yet again. All right, we have some ground to cover. You guys ready for this? Um, we're going to be reading out of First uh, Thessalonians 4. You guys want to go there? Get ready. First Thessalonians 4. You there? You guys there? First Thessalonians 4. All right, guys. First of all, in Thessalonians, right? Often people have preconceived notions. Often they have not read the entirety of Thessalonians as far as its content and context is concerned. It's very important that we all have this whole thing in context. And then we're going to probably slip the rails just a little bit as I um, provoke your mind just a bit. Just a bit. So first, Thessalonians 4. Here we go. Furthermore, then we beseech you, brethren, exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as you have received of us how you ought to walk and to please God, so you would abound more and more. In other words, grow in the word that they taught. For ye know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. Do you guys know what commandments were given to them? By the Lord. Not the Ten Commandments. It's not what it was. It wasn't the Ten Commandments. It was the command of loving your neighbor as yourself. Loving the Lord your God with all of what you are. Okay? For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication. Okay, now listen, folks. This may go on, this may slip the rails a bit, a few times, right, as, as normally when I get into the Word of God and you start reading, right, uh, things open up layer by layer, All right, but they're always good to engage, and it's always good to apply what you have confirmation of internally, okay? So it says, for this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication. Everybody clear on what fornication is? I know people don't like to talk about it because we live in a society where people date. They just date. Mixler is uh, choppy, is it? It shouldn't be choppy. Is it choppy, choppy? How many people have a problem with uh, Mixler? Do you guys have an issue with Mixler? Because it may be your region. Okay, it's good to some people, not good to... If it's choppy, all I can tell you is to refresh your device, okay? Uh, in the event, because some of these uh, third-party... Some of these third-party, um, uh, you know, adapted pieces are not... Uh, obviously, they have to make money, too. Should something happen, which I'm anticipating, we have a platform. I have... I'm not... Nobody... There's... This platform, when it launches, if everything goes down, you guys will see something new on the site. Uh, it's been tested, proven, but it is only for emergencies. So it'll pop up on the site so you guys can access it. And it will take the place of a great many things. Now, that's an emergency tool, right? which means we're not going to use that on a regular basis. That's for emergencies. So the site alters itself during an emergency. That's how that works. That way we can always have, you guys will always be in communication with each other. That's only for emergencies. If we were to launch that now, people would uh, abuse it. They'd get in there and attempt to, you know, do foul things in there. That's why we're not going to, that's not going to be launched until we have a situation that warrants it. Right? Just like the word says, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. If it's not discussed, brought up, and talked about, right, nobody's going to uh, go in and push and inquire about it. We have quite a few things like that. In fact, I kind of live my life like, that way. There are lots of things that uh, nobody knows until at such time when they're needed. And they're always on time. They really are. I got that from the Lord. He does not give us things. You know, in the, for, the Lord provides things as we need it. 
He does not give us things for the sake of peace of mind. He didn't do that. He provides as we need. He always does that. We just have to learn to trust the Lord to provide as we need, right? Most people, if they can't see it up front, they have no confidence in it. And the Lord does not give people things up front so they can have comfort to sit back and relax. That's not how he works. He supplies as we need. And the scripture says he supplies He supplies our needs according to his riches and glory. Needs, not wants. Right? Not, not uh, uh, all these other things, but our needs. He's never failed in doing that. Never. And he never will. He never will. All right. So everybody can hear me, correct? If you guys, uh, if you have choppy sound, refresh your uh, devices. Okay, it is hot, so transmission and communications lines are strained. They're strained. Temperatures are 125. You know what? In just a side note, in Las Vegas, for the last uh, what's today's day? For the last uh, actually, for the last seven days. For the last seven days, it's been above 125 degrees. It has. In fact, that is that seems to be one of those numbers. Now, this is with the formulas applied. This is with the formulas applied. 125 degrees. So we know that the actual temperature is a little bit above that. The same temperature, that was that number I kept giving everybody. right? But we have surpassed um, that in quite a few in other areas. So we're in a brand new, you know, things are happening all around people. They just can't see it. Hopefully I can bring out something tonight. And normally, listen, because no one has ever been ready for what God sent. Why? That Does that bother you guys? How could nobody see what the Lord brought forward? Noah saw him because he was told, right? The people in Egypt, they did not expect what came, but they were told but they did not expect it. They weren't ready for it. Even after that, nobody expected what God truly sent. Even after they got the word from the prophets and the apostles and Jesus himself. Remember when Jesus told Jerusalem, he said, uh, you know, don't cry for me, cry for yourselves. Right? They were not ready. They're always caught off guard. Always. I don't know about you, but I don't, I'm not a reactive person. Right? I'm not. I, I know that the Lord gives us the truth. But if we think we're smarter, or simply because it does not fit within our realm of possibility, we won't believe it. Those people will continue to be in trouble. For those of you who can believe prophecy, embrace them. Don't change them. Don't alter them. You don't need to become an expert on them. Just embrace them. Don't interpret them. Every time somebody interprets prophecy, they end up being caught off guard. I say that because there are too many elements you cannot see. Too many. Too many. Anyway, we'll have that discussion after we do this. So, for this is the will of God, even in your sanctification, that you should abstain. Right? Abstain from fornication. I think this is very important because do you guys understand what fornication does? What, what that is in the first place? Fornication itself. It does, it actually does something to you all. Fornication in this context would be the action of harlotry. Now, harlotry is one of those terms, right? Where you, for the sake of for whatever reason, you hook up with someone. For whatever reason. Are you guys listening? The hookup. You know how you say, well, you know, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'll do you both. Some people do that for security. Some people do that because they cannot overcome certain issues of the flesh. Right? Most people think, it, they believe it's innocent. It is not innocent. It's not. Do you not realize, ladies, that everybody you're with, you absorb DNA 
from the individual you're with, there's also a soul exchange. We're not talking about soul ties. I'm not going to get into the terms that people like. I don't deal with soul ties, right? I don't deal with that. I deal with a tight rawness of the spirit and corruption of that spirit. But when you get intimate with a person, when you do that, you open yourself up on a very deep level. And you begin to absorb traits of the other person. That's how people can become finely tuned, right? And when you're finely tuned, you're actually a partaker of whatever spirits that other person was dealing with in the flesh. You, you take on those traits. You do. Once you're intimate, you're open up to every spirit that person is exposed to having issues with. And you end up having those issues, which is why when you have a breakup, that something happens on the inside. And most often, like you're being ripped apart. But if you do that for the sake of advantage or something like that, that is on a very corrupt level, which is a practice of darkness you don't want to be a part of. Every person you do this with, you take on traits of a personality of the folks you've been with. You're, you lose yourself in other folks until you don't know who you are. And I said, Mike, what is kissing? Is it like fornication? Yes, it is. But let me, let me, if you do that, is that not intimacy? Yes, it is. You guys are adults. That is intimacy. That is a sign, a show of intimacy. And where there's no commitment. See, if you're not commitment, if you're not committed to the other person, when I say committed, I mean do or die, you're not going to go anywhere. No matter what happens, you're not going to go anywhere. It doesn't matter if that person alters themselves or not, you're not going anywhere. Right? Because you connect on a very deep level. That's a problem. Especially us. You're called from the living God and Satan is after you. Just in case you did not know. Now if your life is okay, something is wrong with you and your soul. Because Satan will go after anybody who pursues Christ. Period. That's why you shouldn't think it's strange when you go through things. Right? Now, to be open up on that level, you're going to take on a lot of characteristics that you don't want. Women often say, well, I wonder why I have mood swings. Well, geez, 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 for a person who is innocent, they don't have mood swings. You don't get mood swings until you actually start to go out into the world and do what the world does. And then they get worse and worse, and you take on the traits of every single person you've been with until you lose your mind, right? You open yourself up to spiritual usage from a host of things. You, you know, one emotion can carry thousands of demonic entities. Hope you know that. Think of every emotion you feel having a legion of demons behind it to both enforce, influence, and bring about things regarding that emotion. Think about that. And so when you take on these traits from somebody else, then guess what? You just double the count of op internal opposition to yourselves. That's why some people, right, they get so overwhelmed with violence and anger. That's why. When you begin to separate yourselves from that, the first thing that happens is peace is reestablished in your life. You don't deal with anger. You're not angry anymore, right? You don't have those uh, uh, fits of carnality. But if you stay in that way, you're going to be diagnosed with, with uh, you know, all sorts of issues. Right? One of the big ones now is bipolarism. Right? When people are bipolar, that's what they call it. They give a name to every single instance of influence in this earth. And by the way, uh, listen, I know that people believe in medication. I'll tell you something. Medicine helps you to cope with a condition. Your Father in Heaven desires for you to be healed of your condition. Big Pharma Medicine is only going to help you tranquilize yourself or your organs or your body in some way, form, or fashion to deal with what's going on. 
Your father wants you healed. And most, most importantly, he wants your heart healed. He wants your mind healed. If your heart, your mind can be healed, your soul is okay. Your body will be restored. Do you know that? Why would God heal you on the outside? When the inside is only going to corrupt everything else again. You don't fix with, with a car. When a car has an accident and the engine blows, right? You don't get the outside fixed up with a blown engine and give it back to the person. That's not considered fixed. You make sure that the core of the car is operational, right? The cosmetics always come last. You want the inside of the standard. All of life is based that way. You know that? God doesn't want you renewed on the... Why would he heal you on the outside? And the inside is corrupted and broken. That would be healing you in vain. And side note, God does nothing in vain. Everything he does is with high purpose. High purpose. He's not going to do anything in vain. Remember that. Let's continue. So, that's what that's my fornication is. So, uh, it's not good. Right? It's just not good. And, and when people want to abstain from it, is to, that's when you keep yourself away from it. Listen, and the best way to avoid that, for example, a person or anybody out there who has a problem with looking at nudity on a computer, right? You need to help yourself. Don't secretly engage anything on the internet. You know, when, when, when computers first came out, and because I was already in the, that tech field, in the services, people would bring me their devices at a given point. They'd say, Mike, look at this. It's not working right for their kids. And, and you see all sorts of stuff in the cash. And uh, it was, it was at first it was gambling. Then it was porn, porn, porn. Right? I mean, people, there was a grandmother who was, she had to be about 89. She was looking at porn on a computer. Are you kidding me? And, and the, I used to tell people, listen, the only way to be free from that is to stop doing it secretly. Stop engaging your computer in secret. Don't do that. Open it up to everybody. Never clear your history. Open it up. Because you cannot tempt yourself. And again, with that, if you are to abstain from something, you got to keep everything in the light. Do you hear me? Everything must be in the light. When you have a problem with something, keep it in the light. Don't go off to a secret room and do it unless you're praying to the Most High. Everything else of this earth, put it in the light. And what that does is it makes it by bringing light to an issue like that and exposing it to everybody. You're faced with a choice. And what normally happens is, even your environment can help you resist that stuff. Because what you're doing is feeding the flesh. And if you feed your flesh one time, one time, just all it takes is one time, it's going to want more the next time, and more the next time, and more the next time. I, I, I have a belief. I think that so many people are addicted in the world right now to things, to drugs, right? Because there's another addiction problem that is seldom being addressed. I believe that if the one addiction can go away, God will he'll deal with the rest. He can deal with the substance abuse. But when a person is addicted, right, to pornography, when they're addicted to these immoral things that a computer has enabled, that entertainment has enabled, that's worse than a drug. And I'll tell you why. Because your soul is involved. And once you feed the flesh, it's going to hunger more and more. Your flesh has an automatic lust for things of this world. And lust is an unquenchable desire. You cannot satisfy it. It will only grow. Right? So in order to get out of that area of life, you got to bring everything into the light. You have to actively fight your flesh. You're going to have to fight the good fight of faith. 
Have you noticed that God will not miraculously take that away? Have you noticed that? How many people have prayed and said, Lord, just take away my desire for so and so? He does everything by way of a method of truth. Do you know that? Now he can bestow favor upon you and remove anything he so desires. But if you have a hunger for it, you're going to go back to it over and over again. No matter what he heals you of, no matter what you're fixed of, if you have a hunger for it, you're going to go back. And so what you have to learn to do is overcome your hunger. If you can overcome your hunger, you won't go back. Do you hear me? If you can overcome the hunger, you can be healed. If you can overcome that hunger, you're going to be free. Think about that. You overcome that, and, and it's possible. Listen, it's more than possible. It's more than possible. You can overcome the hunger. Do you hear me? You can fight the good fight of faith. Bring your father into every area of your life, no matter what it is. If it's your drinking, bring your father into it. Expose everything to him. Whatever it is, bring your father into it. And if you truly do believe, I'm telling you something. When conviction falls, when it falls, and God can make that, that conviction can become so heavy that no darkness can survive in the presence of that heaviness that will come by way of the Spirit upon you. That is extremely renewing. And you'll be absolutely free. All of this is granted through Christ. But you have to be willing in the first place. Are you willing? Or do you make excuses for why you need it? you got to be willing. God won't fix anything you're not willing to overcome. you got to be willing to overcome something. You have to be willing to stand and fight. And before you say, oh, I'm not a fighter. Okay, that's almost like saying you're not human. You did not design yourself. You didn't make yourself. You did not assign. Those traits that you have in you, you had nothing to do with that. You were created. You were put here. Never limit yourself. All of what you're capable of is bound within Christ anyway. So stop being the expert of what you're not able to do by faith. Don't do that. Don't do that. God knows what you can and cannot do. You do not. You have to discover that. A lot of people say, well, I'm not strong enough to endure so and so. You don't know that. You don't know that until you go through something. That's when you find out, yes, I'm strong enough to deal with it. I don't like it, but I dealt with it. Remember that. Remember that. Back to Thessalonians. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication. I can almost hear somebody saying, well, what am I supposed to do? Just just leave the person. No, you make it right in the eyes of the Most High. He already knows your situation. He already knows exactly what you're doing, where you are, what your thoughts are. He already knows that. So make it right with him. It's when you have a conversation with him, he's your father with your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who is not without great, great, listen, he has, he has a great concern and an understanding of these complexities of life. Jesus does. That's why the Bible says we do not have a high priest who does, who, who is disconnected, I'm going to paraphrase, who is disconnected from our infirmities. He understands what we deal with. Much grace is given. Much grace if it weren't, all of us would be condemned, wouldn't we? Hmm? Remember that. That every one of you, this is our First Thessalonians four four. That every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. That's the control mechanism, right? To possess your vessel in sanctification and honor is to be able to overcome desires of flesh. To be able to keep it in the light. Do you know what that means? Listen to me. That means you can be as clean as a whistle, no fornication or anything else. 
But guess what? Guess what? If your mind is ruthless, for example, here's a ruthless mind. When you're sitting up and you, you can't help but to make a target of somebody else for some reason. Listen, you're either going to be a forgiving person because your Lord and Savior forgave you. And you're going to hope and help somebody else. Right? There was a time, there was a time that especially dealing with uh, in the military, that I looked for perfection everywhere. I mean everywhere. I had no infractions. I did nothing that included infractions. Nothing. And anybody who didn't meet my standard, well, they were just simply substandard, right? I did not fail at tasks. I did not. And so I tended to, I, I tend to look at everybody else in that same respect. I was never late. Nothing was ever out of timing. Nothing. Everything was perfect. Everything was. Because I had very high standards. Right? I did not like civilians. Because they whined too much. I didn't. Right? And so I would force myself to maintain a, a specific type of appearance. Right? And people drew upon that appearance, even to the posture, to the walk, to the engagement, everything. I mean everything. Everything. Fast promotion, accommodations all over the place, right? Maximum performance in both combat and in garrison. Nice packet. And then the Lord stuck me in a place I did not like the most. I, I didn't... This, what I'm doing right now, let me tell you guys something. When I first started COT, I only had like a, probably about an hour per day, right? To even think about COT. As time progressed, the devil got worse. Oh, he did, right? He tried to make it so I would have zero time with COT. None. I mean, none. In fact, I'd never been called so much, never been tasked so hard since COT began, right? But somehow I still made time for it. I did. I did. There was a time when I thought, okay, I'm scot-free now. I'm good to go now. I can apply everything to COT, right? Because everything's fucked in my life. And as soon as I thought I had time, it wasn't two days later. I'm called overseas. I'm called for, to oversee some things. This I not have anything to take me away from COT, right? Anything. There were times when I did not sleep for about four or five days. That was quite common with me, right? But the devil got really busy. When my heart went towards the gospel of Jesus Christ, big time, when I saw an issue, and COT was beginning its development and its online presence. That's when Satan, oh, he just, he just pulled down all the stops. I mean, all the stops. Everything began to go downhill. Everything. Everything. Because I used to like planning, right? I used to love planning. And in order to get anything, to, to commit to anything, you have to have some time, right? Nope. I mean, it got so bad, I was on an aircraft programming on the side right before it drops somewhere. That's, that's a fact. Isn't that funny? Trying to work out problems and issues with this tech issue and COT and this and the other to get things operational. It is a miracle. It's a miracle that things are done the way they're done. And then it totally took another turn. A turn I don't discuss to this day. But believe me, the devil will never stop. He'll never stop. It's almost like a, it's like a uh, bad joke, right? Then you start to get the time, but then other things go away. See, when I didn't have the time, I had everything else. As soon as you get the time, everything else is gone. Satan never stops, and it requires pure commitment. You have to be able to eat crow, but you have to keep hard charging forward. You're going to be tested on every level. And that's very important that you be tested on every level. Do you know why? 
Because if you're gonna if you're gonna be a part of the gospel of Jesus Christ and you have a desire to carry the gospel of Jesus Christ, Satan is never going to stop pursuing you. This so is what the Lord does is he will expose you to every single condition, circumstance, and everything else. He will throw it right in your face, allow it to be thrown in your face. And that's very important because what if Satan takes down somebody after they're established and everybody else falls apart, correct? You think your father in heaven wants that? No. He wants you built up to be unshakable. That when you carry the gospel of Jesus Christ, you will not fall. That's what the word says. Jesus is able to keep us from falling. So you do not have to fall, but you have to be built up a strong house in the Lord. And in order to be built up, you have to uh, endure many situations and issues. You're not going to look too good, but you must simply go forward by faith. When you're doing things by faith, there's no promise. You're going to get it done. There's no promise. You're doing it by faith. You're not doing it by some sort of contract. You're doing it by faith. By faith. That's very important. Because if, if the Lord did not test us in every area, all Satan would have to do is wait till a person gets built up. Wait till people trust that person. Wait till everything grows, and then Satan can come along and knock it down anytime he gets ready. Your relationships are like that, too. If your relationship never endured the trials, it needs to endure. Or you, you could go along, develop a family, have everything you want, and all Satan would have to do is dry up the money at some point. And if that's enough to make you fall apart... He could destroy everybody in the household. That's exactly how Satan works. He likes to get things built up and then pull the rug out from underneath it. And God allows it. Now, what happens when you have unmovable faith? The rug is pulled out, yet you keep going forward. You do. You keep going forward. Right? That's, what I, that's why I don't like discussing certain things in this platform. The Lord knows I'm going to go forward. He knows it. And I know when I'm gone, there will be a testimony from everything in COT. There's going to be a testimony. Isn't that funny? See, because once you know a person's whole story, it has great impact upon those who learn it. But have you noticed in the life of all these people who made real change, no one celebrated them? while they were living, right? Why? Because they do not cry and whine and do all those things. There's no whining, no crying, correct? None of that. So when they're gone, people find out the true story, and it helps others, uh, their faith. That's when a person says, I, I want to be like that. Hmm? There's something in it. That's exactly why we read about these people today in the Bible. And we are encouraged and moved by their level of faith, by their commitment, by them following the instruction they received. And we attempt to base our lives to follow that standard that so many of them set. Anyway. That's the way that works anyway. So, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles, which know not God, that no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any manner, because the Lord is the avenger of all of such, as we also have forewarned you and testified. For God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. He therefore that despiseth, despiseth not man but God, who hath also given us his Holy Spirit. That word despise seems strong, but in fact it is a demonic trait, a devilish trait. It is a trait of the flesh that will jump in people's flesh, and they will just listen. That, that to despise, to dislike someone is one thing. To despise them 
is something else. You'll see that in the world if you look carefully. Imagine someone who has been wrong in the past, right? In fact, this will, this, this subject exists on television today, on some news story today. But imagine somebody wronged somebody in the past, and they become a famous person. The person who was wronged, they watch the person every week. Every week. And every week, they get angrier and angrier at the person because nothing, no, nobody's avenging that person, right? That person is not being avenged. The other person is becoming successful, yet the person who was the victim is not getting credit nor money. They start to despise the person who wronged them. They won't accept their apology, right? Listen to me. They won't accept their apology. They won't accept anything. They just grow to despise until finally... 80 years later, they come out and tell the matter and try to crush the person. Lots of that happened, huh? You know how people say, well, you know, 80 years ago, this person bumped up against me. Well, what do you want to do to that person? I'm going to sue him. For how much? I'm going to sue him for, you know, a couple million. Is that really going to take away what happened, though, that's when a person despises someone. When a person wants retribution for being wronged 50 years ago, right? 50 years ago. Uh, something is not right with the whole thing. That's called, that's when a person despises another. And normally it happens to those who become successful. If you have wronged anybody and you become successful, right? Don't think that the folks you have wronged won't find, you know, they won't find out who you are. If you wrong anybody and you become successful, there are people out there that will despise you for what you did. They will not accept your apology. And sooner or later, it happens every single day, these people come forward to try and ruin your life. These are elements Satan often uses in the world. To despise someone is when somebody is eaten up with bitterness. And they never stop pursuing you, right? I already know I'll never have those issues. Thank you, Lord. Never. But I'll also never be, you know, in the spotlight like most people. But it happens every day. And that's a good example. That's a, that's a very good example of a person despising another. It eats a person up from the inside out and they never stop pursuing you. Because Satan will always have an avenue through anyone who seeks vengeance. If you seek revenge, there's an open door in you directly to the devil himself. And he will utilize that door to get at those, right? He's attempting to persecute. Remember that. So if you agree to keep vengeance in your heart and you start despising someone, that's nothing less than a satanic door. For Satan himself to use you against a person in the earth. Remember that. Remember that. Shut. Try and shut those doors. By way of forgiveness. By way of forgiveness. Let's continue. Four. Oh, let me go back. For God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. He therefore that despiseth, despiseth not man, but God, who hath also given us the Holy Spirit. But as touching brotherly love, you need not that I write unto you, for ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another. That's very interesting. Ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another. No wonder a baby. No wonder a baby loves. They, they can just give somebody a hug naturally. Taught of God. Isn't that something? We too are taught of God. How to love. Aren't we? We're taught of God how to Nobody had to teach us that. We fight it sometimes. But if you believe in Christ, you it's almost like you do not have an ability to shut your love off. Do you know that? If you truly belong to the living God, you do stand ready to forgive quite a few things. You do. And you'll always do that at a disadvantage to yourself. That's a trait. 
That's a characteristic of love itself placed in you by the living God that manifests most often in this earth. Huh? That's what that is. And indeed, you do it toward all brethren which were in Macedonia. But we beseech you, brethren, that you increase more and more. And that you study to be quiet and to do your own business and to work with your own hands as we commanded you. Here it is. Now, this is, this is a beautiful one, too. This is both beautiful. This is a very interesting verse here. 410 says, And indeed, indeed, ye do it toward all brethren, which, were in, um, all, uh, which are in all Macedonia. But we beseech you, brethren, that you, that you increase more and more, that you study to be quiet and to do your own business, as 1 Thessalonians 4.11. You study to be quiet and to do your own business and to work with your own hands as we commanded you. You know, so many people are in the business of criticizing, right? They're just criticizing. What I mean by that is this. Say, for example, a person is out there there are lots of people who like to criticize. I mean, even I like, I like to be criticized. I like to be evaluated, right? I have to have, I have to know the complaints of folks. And somehow the Lord will let me know that all the time. But I'm one who can use that to refine things for the sake of people. Because whatever I do is for people, right? I'm not doing it for me. That's why I never take it. I don't take it personally. I'm doing something to refine something for people. Even if they, whether they accept it, you know, or not, is for them. But to criticize, just to criticize, yet not lift a finger to do anything yourself. The Lord is speaking. The Lord has always spoken against that. In other words, why would I criticize the efforts of this guy over here who's trying his best to do something, and I'm not willing to lift a finger to do anything? Think about that. The Lord, what the Lord is telling us is don't have your mind and your, your heart in that area of life. See, there are so many people who are unwilling to lift a finger to do anything for anybody, yet they're ready to criticize the work of another, but they themselves will not work. They're ready to criticize these efforts of others, but they themselves have no efforts towards folks like that, right? They don't. The best critics are those who are trying to do the same thing you are. The worst critics are those who won't do anything for anybody. Because that's not criticism. That's called a complaint. No, I don't mind complaints either, but it's not good for us to have complaints. In other words, if we're not willing to go out in that field of servitude, why in the world would we place our negative tongue on somebody else's servitude? And we're not willing to do the same, right? This way should not be in any believer. Matter of fact, believers should be less a critic, more of a doer. And I like to do. That's why I don't criticize too much. I'm always inquiring. Hey, let me jump in there and help you out. And I forget criticism. That's useless to me. Telling someone where they're wrong. People know where they're wrong. People know where they messed up. They need someone to come alongside to amplify skill sets, to amplify their efforts. I like doing things like that. Right? But we'll let the world continue to be critics. I like to act. I'm a doer. After I'm a hands-on person. So, so, this is what the scripture is starting to bring out. That you study to be quiet, listen, and to do your own business and to work with your own hands as we commanded you, that you may walk honestly toward them that are without or outside, and that ye may have lack of nothing. There's also a promise in this. There's a promise in this. Study to be quiet, right? Anybody know what that is? It's not actually going into a book and getting a, getting a book called How to Be Quiet. That's not what that is. To study to be quiet is to examine the conduct in being quiet, right? To enter into that same conduct of being quiet. Just like the proverb says, a wise man is slow to speak and quick to listen. Right? Proverbs also says that a fool is full of criticism. That's what it says. But a wise man is very different thing. Listen to everything, right? So in other words, if you emulate anybody, emulate the wise, 
they take in everything. They have they don't have everything to say about everybody. They don't. They sit quietly and they, they hear all things. See, that's where I get that from in Proverbs. It it essentially said that wise people can hear everything. But they rely upon the living God of what they take in. They don't criticize everything they hear. They don't become inflamed at what they hear. That's right. It also says they're slow to anger, right? Slow to anger. I know that hardly does exist in this world. But the very wise people are very slow to anger. And the reason why, right? A wise person is simply a person who knows how to apply the knowledge they have. They also do things in a, in a, in a different way. So as it turns out, wise people are actually caring people. They're always looking for solutions. So they really don't have time to be a crick. They really don't have time to engage in, in tail bearing, right? All these different uh, debates and things like that. They don't have time for that. They're looking to, to have a solution for something always. They're also looking for growth always and correction always. They don't have time for the drama suit that most people require every single day to live their lives. They don't require that. And so in the same, in the same uh, respect, in the same regard, the Lord is he's, he's conveying through his prophets, through his apostles, giving us a way that we can walk honestly, right? He's giving us a formula, actually, a way that we can engage our lives in a, in a reformed or conformed manner to him, which is to study, to be quiet, learn to be observant and quiet. Learn to take in, to, to examine many things, right? But always rely upon the Holy Spirit for confirmation of the truth that you will hold. To do your own business. That's for those who, you know, sometimes social media. I don't have social media, right? I don't do that interaction thing, but I know what that's all about. I know what it's all about. When you are exposed to the business of other people, you cannot help but to put your two cents in it. That's everybody. Doesn't matter who you are, that's everybody. You cannot help but to have a point of view about what a person is doing. Now, you can be drawn in by these things. And when you begin to engage, and you carry the story of somebody else, you're actually starting to do something that's an abomination to the Most High. You know, God calls it an abomination. When you take somebody else's business, and you give it to somebody else, do you know that? Tail bearing is what that's called, being a tail bearer. To take somebody else's information and you go and give that to somebody else as a tail, as tail bearing, that's when you cannot help but to spread the story of somebody else. And if you're a Christian and you spread the, the story of misfortune of somebody's life, there's a, there's a curse promise over you by the living God that he won't repent of. You do that to somebody. You spread somebody's misfortune. You mock their misfortune. He'll put you in the exact same circumstance. Imagine a person has lost their family. They're falsely accused of something. They go to jail. And somebody begins to scoff them. And they're a believer in Christ. Do you not know that the Lord God said he would put you in their position so that you perfectly understand that position? Because if you start doing that, if you start doing that and you truly believe it, you can never repent of what you just did. You have to have a full understanding of somebody's life before you reach a conclusion about it. And so now the Lord has to, in order for you not to be lost, he has to qualify what you just said. Because here it is. If you have an idea about someone, are you going to repent of the idea that you have? In most cases, you will not because it's just an idea, and you don't even know it's cursing your whole life. When you have this negative outlook on someone, and you don't know all the facts, and you're cursing them or judging them, and you don't know all the facts, you're essentially condemning yourself. Listen, there are plenty of cups in this world that look dirty on the outside. Just remember something, only God can see the inside. That's why I withhold my tongue from ever judging any cup. I don't care if it's dirty or clean. I don't know what the inside is. The most high does. And the inside makes that cup usable or not. And God help anybody who curses. A dirty cup that's clean on the inside. God help you on that one. 
See, you'll never repent of that. That's why God must put you in that circumstance. And in most cases, I've seen people lose everything. I mean everything. They get built up, and God allows them to lose everything. Their families, their everything is lost. And they end up understanding that person's position. And only when the grunt of the weights are sitting on their heads till it almost crushes them, do they say, Lord, forgive me. I didn't know, but I know now. Forgive me for what I was saying about that person. Now I understand. But see, that happens after they're almost crushed to the ground. Why would a person ever have to get to that level? I opt to learn from those who have already gone through it. I do not need to have weights put on me to believe that somebody is clean on the inside that may be dirty on the outside. So I leave the inside and the judgment of such to the Most High who can see it. I will not take a position on a person. I won't do it. I will either assist in the gospel, but I will never do Satan's work of cursing someone or targeting someone. And so doing, I can truly love my neighbor without reservation and without hesitation. People say, well, what if you get hurt? So then Jimmy crack corn. I'm always hurt. And I will, even from those who hurt me, do you not know my door is still open? My door will always stay open to humanity, period. I do not expect a person who does not know the path of love to entreat me with love. Somebody has to be there to invite that person who knows nothing about love in. Somebody has to be able to take the smack in the face. Somebody has to be able to take someone else spitting in your face to demonstrate what, what true love is. Correct? But who is God going to set up to be an example of his true love in the earth? People are so offended. Somebody smacks somebody on the right cheek, they will not turn to the, they won't turn the left cheek to them. They smack them back. That's not what God called anybody for. So who can he send? Who will not start running their mouth about the sin that they can observe? Well, God did not disclose their sin to anybody. Huh? Who will he send? You have to be willing to be backstabbed multiple times. You have to be willing to be stepped on, scoffed, mocked, your name drugged through the mud, whatever it takes. And never lash out at a person for doing that. You have to be able to take everything. Let me tell you something, that takes strength beyond strength. And most are too weak to be sent like that. It's a weakness to smack somebody back in the face after they smacked you. It takes strength to absorb it all. Hear that, gentlemen? Weaklings hit back. You're already built to take it. Let me continue. So we study to be quiet, to do your own business, and to work with your own hands. He says, as we commanded you, that you may walk honestly toward them that are without, and that you may have lack of nothing. So in order to walk honestly into the world, so to speak, right, these ways must be within you. That's why he said, first, study to be quiet. Then he said, do your own business. Work with your own hands. Right? For what, 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 for what reason? That you may walk honestly toward them that are without or those strangers of the world. That you may be honest with the strangers of the world. Right? Then. Then it goes to something else. And this is the heart of our conversation. First Thessalonians uh, 4.13 going forward is the heart of this conversation. This first part is a very simple reminder of the vulnerabilities 
that often beset us. These things that we continue to fall prey to. And we should not fall prey to them. How do you not fall prey to these things? The basics of the word of God must be reviewed from time to time. Never forget to do that. Never forget to look upon these things in the word of God to make sure that you're grounded and rooted. Make sure of that. I'm trying to encourage you. Do you guys know that your position with the people of the world is something that can many will not be able to match? You're looking at great people that have been in your life and you don't even know that you're the great ones. You, you have no idea you're the great ones. You don't know that, do you? You can't even see it. Most of you can't see it, but you are. You are. It took some great ones in your past to labor for you that you may be raised up. That a word would get to you. Imagine that. Imagine what the Lord did and who he called so that the word could reach you, so that the word would survive to get to you. Think about that. All those people who fell before you so that you could have the word of God. He didn't do that so you could throw it away. And he did not alter the course of those who paid the ultimate price. No, you had to survive. You had to be here. And you had to be a recipient of his word. Because there is a task for you to do. You don't know who you are. The first will be last and the last will be first. You're the ones that are going to observe a time that nobody else before you could take. Do you not know that those of old could not live in the time we live in now? Do you know that? They couldn't. The temptation is far too high. Do you know that? See, there was a time back in the past when a woman couldn't even show her ankles. Do you know that? That was a temptation. Your ankles were a temptation. Ladies, your ankles, you know, right above your foot with two knobs on it, two doorknobs above your foot are called ankles. And that was a temptation to men. And so it had to be covered. Do you know that? Where do you think these, the hymns came from? That was so it could slide through the dirt, right? It wouldn't mess up the material of the dress. By the way, they used to replace the hymns on, on women's wear. A lot. But they used to be, could, they, could those people who were tempted by two doorknobs on a person's foot, they would have a heart attack today, wouldn't they? Because they're showing a whole lot more than the ankles. Wouldn't you say? Wouldn't you say? I remember watching, I was watching uh, one of these uh, black and white movies, right? And they also had that, they could not show the ankles of women. They couldn't show it. It was a massive temptation. Think about that. If you start looking at what these women wore, it was to stop the temptations. Think about that. They couldn't show that. They couldn't even show their arms. What? The arm. Yeah, they couldn't show the arm. I have no idea, but they couldn't show the arm. Okay, they couldn't do that. They were covered, truly covered. But nowadays, listen to me, nowadays, to go, they would have all fell down. They would have, you know what? The, that generation would have died if they went to a beach. They would have died. They wouldn't be able to take that temptation. But nowadays, you guys see it. Listen to me. You guys see it. And you're not moved by it. Now, that doesn't mean it's permissible. That's not what it means. And it's by no means what it means. It just means many people have sown into you, into these generations. And there are many things that you have overcome. But there are some great weaknesses that have also been formed. Can you imagine being a prophet back in those days? 
priests often would not even look at a woman with boots on. Do you know that? That's a fact. When I found that fact out, that almost blew me away. A priest would not look upon a woman with boots on back then. But let me ask you guys something. Do you perceive right now the world is absolutely disgusting? It, it really is. And I'm, you guys have to forgive me. I know nobody thinks anything about bathing suits or anything, but I do. I do. I think it's indecent. I do. I think it's very indecent. You may not think much about the language and everything. I think it's indecent. The ways of this, this stuff that people are doing, they have no idea what they're inviting into their lives. I find it truly indecent. You can't even watch television, let alone hear what they're saying by audio. Because they're always cursing or insinuating things that are absolutely disgusting and perverted. And everywhere you turn, high rebellion of what God has designed a person to be is everywhere. They're just rebelling against everything that the Father did. This is the world we live in. Now, most people cannot perceive it, right, for one of two reasons. If you're a Christian, if you're a Christian, you were born and raised in an environment where these things were normal. People who are raised at a beach don't perceive the nudity that's being shown at a beach. It's no big deal, right? Because they're dealing with it. People who are born around people with, uh, you know, they use foul language a lot, they can scarcely perceive the foul language. They scarcely perceive it. I do not cuss. I don't even slip and curse. Do you guys know that? I do not slip and curse. I don't slip and curse. Nobody slips and curses. They do it knowingly. I don't do that. Because the Bible says, let no, let no corrupt communication come out of your mouth, right? We're not supposed to have that foul stuff in our mouths. And I, I know where those words come from. So, it, so I don't engage. Many do not know where those words come from. And people think them harmless. They do. They think them harmless. See, a person who is in ignorance, and that word ignorance means they don't know. People who truly do not know, they can be forgiven of such things. But those who do know, who find them absolutely immoral, hopefully they won't engage. Right? That's where I, I won't engage. I won't curse. I don't use it. I think it demeans communication in the first place. But this world has become so incredibly immoral that now they have, you know, nudity is, is common to children. New things, strong fornication themes are common to children. Deceit, deceptiveness, justified murder, all these things are acceptable in, these, in this society. And I'll tell you something, those of old would have perceived so much more that they couldn't make it in this generation. Some of you have been built up, which means you can perceive it. But you overcome it daily. I think I put myself in that category. I can't partake of half of what I'm seeing. And one of the greatest and more things that I've ever seen is this cruelty towards humanity. When I was young, I hated when I saw people pick sides. I hated it. Somehow I could see the truth of it. I couldn't stand it because somebody had to lose. Why would you set somebody up to lose? I, I didn't like it because I gave somebody an excuse to demean another. Right? You guys were sent in a time in the middle of darkness with the light. The light is your faith in Christ, your faith in your Father. Do you hear me? We are truly living in a very dark place. But the Lord sent you, because you believe in Christ, you're sent as a light. And Satan will always fight to have you pervert your own faith. Do you hear me? He's competing for you now to have you believe in specific ways. He will occupy your mind with making decisions. He'll increase 
your heart towards infighting and justify infighting of those. I'm talking about those in the house of God, those who believe in Christ. He desires to turn you against anybody he can. So I ask of you something. Resist him at all levels. Fulfill the word of the Lord and love your neighbor. Resist the devices of the enemy. Don't allow him to cause you to target another human being. The next person you don't like in your life, I want you to really look at that person and tell me that person is not deceived. Because if they, listen, Satan is the one that convinces people that sin is no big deal. Satan is the one that convinces people that all this earthly stuff is the way to go. Satan is the one that convinces people to, to turn away from the living God and to turn to falsehoods. And when you look at a person who's given the falsehoods, who's steeped in witchcraft and all this other stuff, I want you to give a close look at them. And what do you see? Can I tell you what you'll see? You'll see a human being who is highly deceived by the enemy. Now, if you condemn that person, you're in full agreement with Satan, aren't you? Because you're not in agreement with the Savior. The Savior came to save such. So if you agree with Satan, and you agree that they're evil and all this other stuff, and they should be cast away or something, you're in full agreement with Satan who came to persecute humanity. I'll tell you up front, I do not agree with the accuser of the brethren. I do not. If a person is deceived, are they not lame? If a person will not hear or cannot hear the word of God, are they not deaf? If they can't see that Jesus is real and is inviting everyone to cover everyone, then they're blind, aren't they? Blind. And I will never agree with Satan that that person should fully be condemned. Never. Doesn't the Bible say for some, pulling them back from the gates of hell itself? Oh, yes, it does. You'll see lots of those people out there. Hmm? Hey, I don't know about you, but uh, I'll never, I'm not siding with Satan. I'm not doing that. I've already been on the other side of the fence. I've been the prosecution. I've already been there and done that. I will not assist him. I will not assist Satan. He'll think of a thousand ways to have you condemn someone. I want you to think of that next time. You have a heavy disdain for anybody. Look at what the person really is. And remember why that person has life. No one has life on their own. No one. Even the tares have an opportunity. Do you not know that? Lord, have mercy. But it just so happens in the word of God. They don't want that opportunity. I'm asking you, please do not be like one of them. Because as I said at the beginning of this conversation, nobody, nobody, nobody ever got it right when it came to these great things in the earth, these great destructive events that came on earth. It always catches people off guard. Always. And it will catch people off guard again. And if you're on the wrong side, you won't be coming back to the right side. The close of this error quickly approaches. You knew when you were born. Somehow you knew when you were born. You lived 
in the last generation. You can see these young kids now, and you already know that their future may not be a future at all. You already know that. And there are people in the White House right now, young senators who know the same thing. They have the same spirit in them. They know this is it. They know it. They know it. They may not be popular because they don't get TV time, but they know it. You were born with that. Nobody misdirect, nobody coordinated that because we were all born with that. We know this is it. We know it is. So make sure, because you have the call and eat. Make sure you have responded to the call and you're not being deceived yourself. Because if Satan can, he'll have you have come all this way only to have you condemn someone in the heart that you would be condemned by the living God. You know, in Revelation, it says Satan is enraged. He knows he has but a short time. He's going to try everything he can to get you off track. Everything. You're close. That's why the command was watch and be ready. Watch and be ready. Watch and be ready. I'll be right back in a few minutes right here at COT. Okay, everybody. I am back. Thessalonians 4.13 But I will not have you ignorant. Brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others, which have no hope. Those who, you know how you're feeling, sorry for those who, who maybe you think don't have the opportunity? Huh? Maybe you think, uh, sometimes even, maybe you think they didn't pass the mark. Right? For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Now that's, that's so curious, saying this back then, because there was a dispute about the resurrection. That was a major dispute for those who carry the gospel. A belief in the resurrection. Do you know that? Kind of like the Kind of like the, uh, some of the things that people argue about today. Same thing was happening back then, except in this case, it was the resurrection. So he says, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and we do, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Sleep means those who have passed away. Those who are gone but they were in Christ. Right? Because back then, you guys remember the term shield, right? You guys remember some of the some of the ideologies that they had back then. Like if you were gone, you went into this place where, you know, you were just stuck like Chuck. Nobody could, you know, come and get you. And people had a diversity of beliefs. In some cases, they thought you had to earn your way into heaven. You did, into paradise or something like that, right? Uh, so there were all sorts of beliefs. And what the apostle is saying is that God will bring his saints with him. Coming with him. Now listen, for this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain, as at, you see that term, it says, we which are alive and remain, Unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep or passed away or gone. That's what asleep means. Right? The ones we count as kaput in the grave, gone. We're not going to prevent them which are asleep. We're not going to hinder them which are asleep. We're not going to, you know, somehow that'll be stopped or interfere with it. Even though you still believe. Right? For the Lord himself, now this, this is the part. 
For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel. Now, that's been lost over time, what the voice of the archangel is. Anybody know what the voice of the archangel is? Anybody? I have, I have uh, three proofs, I guess you could say, stating in ancient tongues what they are, what the voice of an archangel is. The voice of the archangel is a trumpet blast. Trumpet blast. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. Specifically, it says, with the voice of the archangel. And with the trump of God. There it is. So it's, it's right there. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Now, a lot of people get in their hands. They get in their hands. And when Jesus comes, those who are in the grave will come up. Right? When Jesus comes, didn't we just read that those who are alive will not prevent those which are asleep? That God will bring with him those which are asleep. Didn't we just read that in Thessalonians 4.14? We just read that. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. We just read that. Just read that. See, we just read that. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel. Now, it gets very specific with the voice of the archangel. Not with the voice of all the archangels, but with the voice of the archangel. That's an appointed archangel. It was understood he was talking about Michael. With the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then after that happens, listen, then after that happens, after that, not before, after that happens, then we which are alive, those of us who believe in Christ, who are alive and remain. See, many are not going to remain, but those who remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds, with them, plural, in the clouds. So they truly are coming back with him. So that means those who, who pass are with him. They shall be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. This is the controversial piece. This is where people say, well, the Lord's, you know, he's, he's, he's coming back early and then in the middle and then late, right? They get into the rapture thing. I do not. I simply get into the word of God. I believe the word of God. I believe what was given by the Holy Spirit to the apostles and the prophets. I believe it. I do not get into the complexities of what people think. Because God will interpret his own word. God is the expert of his own word, not man. Man is never the expert on God's word. They've always messed it up. It sounds eloquent, but it doesn't work out. And history shows us the word of man never works out. Though it sounds eloquent, though the puzzle pieces fit, but why they have the wrong puzzle every single time. The only time man ever had the right puzzle is if God gave it to them, gave it to them directly, like when he gave it to Noah directly, like, like when he gave it to Moses directly. Otherwise, man has had the wrong puzzle. So when they fit their little pieces together, it may fit by way of thought. That doesn't mean it's truth. We are to have the truth. Not some theory. That's why I don't like theories. When something is undefined, I leave it alone. The Lord will bring about the truth of it. Uh, see, I want the truth. I do not want some popular theory. I don't want what everybody thinks. In fact, if everybody has a consensus towards it, it can't be right. which are alive and remain, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Have that story be carried down from generation to generation. Don't alter it. But it should be a comfort. So, 
Here's what this means. Here's what people are forgetting, though. While everybody's looking for the rapture, right? Why do they always forget that somebody's rapture is coming in one minute? And somebody's rapture is coming in three minutes. They're certainly going to be up with the, They're going to be asleep, considered asleep, which means they're going to be with the Lord. Now you know that that term asleep is just like that thief on the cross. Jesus said today, you're going to be with me in paradise. He said that to a thief who had no works of goodness in his life towards the Lord. He simply believed. And then he demonstrated his faith, didn't he? Huh? He did not deny before men the Christ. He acknowledged before men the Christ. He didn't just tell it. No. He was in a life or death situation. And he had faith even to the point of death. That's why he was with the Lord. So we're not talking about somebody who would just go out and read the Bible to everybody. Nope, sorry, that's not going to do it. Because even the devil does that. No, we're talking about those when it comes down to the, to the, to the metal meeting the meat. That person will say, nope, the Lord is my Lord. He is Jesus of Nazareth. If their life depends on it, if their finances depend on it, whatever it is, they will acknowledge the Lord. People are so afraid of that. I'll tell you something. Because I, would not, I don't want you guys to be naive. I had a choice to make. And it came down to a, one of those real choices. You could easily renounce the radicalism of Christianity. Somebody told me one time, and told me if I would just stop, just stop, stop what I'm doing. I'd be secure. I didn't even have to think about that one. I said, no, I have to do what I'm called to do. Great conviction behind it. It's gotten me nothing but trouble in this world. That's a fact. But I will not deny what I believe in so strongly. See, it doesn't matter. See, if everybody stopped believing, if they came out with proof, they said, well, Jesus is not real and this didn't happen, it wouldn't sway me a bit. It does not get to me. My faith was established internally, not externally. It was not established by any proof. It was established in the beginning. I believed from the beginning. Man did not give that to me, nor is that a, a, some, some product of environment. No. That faith was given to me. I won't betray it. I'm not doing that. See, there was a time I picked career over my faith. In the early years, there was. There was a time I would, I would rather be quiet concerning my faith and have the promotion. There was a time when I set up for two or three nights attempting to justify why I needed to have my future secured. Hmm. I've already been there and done that. I'm not doing that again. Nope. Because Jesus never wavered. Ever. He never wavered. And what the Lord did is sufficient for me. I don't need anything else. I do not follow him for, I don't follow him like that. He did everything for me at the cross. Man did not confirm that story within me. That was supernaturally confirmed from my youth. If God has shown me anything, he's shown me do not have your dependency upon flesh. Keep your dependency upon me. So no, I won't do it. But I'm like, you know, it may cost you everything in the world. 
it may cost you everything of the world. Settle it in your hearts now. I'm not one of those that's going to tell you, yeah, if you choose Christ, all your problems are going to go away. And that's not what happened. And that's not what happens. You're confronted. You're fought tooth and nail. You'll find out what the system is. You'll find out it's indeed a system that is designed against your faith. See, because if the story, if the story is about good and evil, and that evil is attempting to corrupt you, that you would be shunned from all things of the living God. If that's what the whole story is about, if that's what the opposition of creation is about, then everything based in this world is going to follow that narrative, which means every system in this world that is influenced by Satan is going to come against your faith. Open your eyes and see it. Every opportunity in the world is a step backward and will ultimately fight your faith in Christ. Many of you already, you depend upon the world. I did it too. I bent over backwards. Now with the military, I can say this. I did not perform for a paycheck. I did not. But it doesn't make that, you know, performing for something else any different for those who do perform for a paycheck. Hmm? So measurement between the two. But everything in this world is designed to entrap you. Everything. Open your eyes and start seeing everything that draws you in this world is causing you to put down the principles of Christ and to justify darkness and the usage of those things in the darkness. Open your eyes and see it. And then ask yourself what these influences are. See them for what they are. Because if you're not careful and if you're not knowledgeable about those things of Christ, you'll be drawn away. Many are already drawn away, even this year. They're drawn away. They're drawn away. And the result is they're going to be guilty of murder. Do you hear me? Murder. A long time ago, and I'm, I use this, use this uh, description, but I used to tell everybody about your life. It's like a chess game. And somebody sets up the board. And they ask you to pick a side, don't they? They say, pick a side. Pick a side. That's what they ask you. Right? One side is favorable. One side is not. The end of that, after I tell people that, I tell them this. You don't have to play the game. There's no rule that says you have to play the game. And I'll tell you why I say that. The Lord showed me that early. Unfortunately, I ignored that. He, I, I, had a, I had a dream, a something, and a chessboard was set. I mean, a beautiful chessboard was set in front of me. And it felt like if I chose a side, I was going to get something. That's what it felt like. But then it was told to me, don't play the game. That's it. That was the end of that dream. Don't play the game. I pondered about that for just about all my life. Getting older, I understood it perfectly. See, because that chessboard is somebody else's game and somebody else's design. Somebody else designed the chessboard. And a game is designed to engage the one who sees it they will instantly have a desire and they have to pick one side or the other to play. But there's no rule saying you have to play. The trick is getting you to choose a side when you don't have to. And when you choose a side, you're in the game. The game is the world of which the Lord called us out of. See, I found out 
I can be right in the middle of the world. You can be right in the middle of a career, a job, or anything else, but you still don't have to play that game. You don't have, no, you don't. You don't have to play that game. When you get drawn in to play the game, you're set against your opponent. That's how you know it's not from the living God. You know what? Even Michael, the Bible says, Michael, the archangel, dares not bring accusation against Satan, but simply said, the Lord rebuked thee when they disputed over the body of Moses. So Michael didn't even, he didn't cast these insults at Satan himself. He didn't do that. He did not. He didn't devise plans against them. He did not do that. None of them did. Men do that. And those tactics come from one source, and it did not come from our father. It didn't. That came from Satan, the devil, Beelzebub, the dragon. That's where it comes from. No wonder in Revelation, because people believe in that game, no wonder in Revelation it says a world worshipped the dragon, and they worshipped the beast. Then you can't see the dragon. Though people choose it every single day, the dragon is a system which is called the devil and Satan. Not just the devil, not just Satan, but the devil and Satan, which are titles, imply exactly what his character is. That resistor of faith, the accuser of the brethren, right? He is in the world. And these kingdoms and systems in the world are designed to engage, to make you engage, to make you pick a side. The whole game is evil. But once you pick a side, you're taught to go against your enemy. You only find out that the whole game is evil when you say, I'm not playing. That's when you find out what the game is designed for. Because if you don't engage the persecutors come. When you refuse to play, here they come. They're going to back up every aspect of that game. If you know how to play chess, they're going to come to you and say, nope, you're a rook, you're a pawn, you're this, you're that, you got to play, you got to make that move. They'll come to you your entire life telling you that you have to play that game. The Lord showed me early, don't play it. I didn't listen, of course. And I almost got too deep in it where I could not get out. But, as consistency of the word is, because see, in the word it said, God will make a way of escape. And by the way, that way of escape is not to escape out of a trial or tribulation. God said he would make a way of escape when you're trapped in a sinful situation. When you're in a sinful situation, God will make a way of escape. A door will open that you can exit the situation. He'll do it every time. He'll do it every time. And when the Lord does that, you better believe this supernatural hand is upon your life. Do you hear me? His supernatural hand. You'll never know that until you take that step of faith. If you don't walk by faith, you're not going to know it. See, with the Lord, you have to take that step first, and then he'll show you. Because if it were not for the most high, I'm dead, I'd be a dead person, a condemned person and a dead person. There are things far worse than death. Far worse. Far worse. Far worse. But see, some of you, listen, I say this not to condemn, but to let you know I know some of you are on in that game. And you're, you're losing your children. That's what it seems like. You're losing those things in your life you truly love. You're trying to hold on, and every time you reach out to hold on, something happens, and you look worse and worse in their eyes. And you know you're in trouble, but you keep playing the game. The longer you play the game, the less you're going to trust faith the more you're going to need proof. That's exactly how that works. The more you engage, 
You're just not going to trust faith. That's when you start giving bad advice. Huh? That's when you tell a person, go save yourself. Save yourself. Well, God doesn't want us to suffer. And you start coming up with all these different terms, which are quite foolish. In essence, you tell a person, well, just go ahead and stay in the world. And just, just make it the best you can. God understands. He sure does. He understands that he called you out of the world. You were born with a calling in you to get out of the world. That's why you saw the world in a very strange way. You just tried to get out your own way. You're trying to be the author of your own salvation, and that will never work. You can't save yourself. You're going to fail every single time. Why would Jesus have the title of Savior, and yet you're the one saving yourself? That, that's not going to happen. That will never happen. But see, people, sometimes we get prideful, don't we? We want to be the person who can sit back and say, ah, see, I made the right choice back then. Forget about that. Who's going to say that the Lord delivered me from this instead of saying to everybody, trying to impress them, oh, yes, yes, I was wise enough to get out of this. Let me show you how to do it in this book, this twenty nine ninety five. I'll tell you right now, the Lord delivered me. I was put in a position where nothing could deliver me. And the Lord did deliver me. And there was suffering involved. Jimmy Crack Corn, so what? You know, a lot of people look at me and they wonder how I can have faith under such persecution at times. Under circumstances at times. With the losses at times. They don't know how in the world I'm functioning. I mean, for goodness sake, these guys, they just swarping down. I had PTSD. Well, there's no way he's, or he's got to have PTSD. No one goes through that and does not have PTSD. But I do not. You know, I have confidence in Christ. I know who to go to when I'm messed up, and I have no problem telling the Lord I just totally messed it up. But I just won't go to him for forgiveness. I'll go to him because he's home. That's home for me. I take no comfort among men in their systems. I take great comfort in the kingdom of God. I'm doing things by faith. I do not want proof of concept. I don't want proof and any comforts in life, provisions that are shown months in advance. I don't want any of that. I'm going to walk by faith. I desire to be pleasing unto the Most High. I will not follow after the fashion of the world and fall deeper for it. No. I'm going to be one of those who absolutely trusts in the living God for real. Not fakely, not just by words. You know, some people just do it by words. They'll talk all day about the Lord, but when it comes down to it, they save themselves. When it comes down to it, they have no comfort unless they see their own provision. They cannot take a step of faith. They need reassurances. I don't want to be like that. I do not want to be like that. And as a consequence, more and more of this world is exposed to me to see it for true, what it truly is. If you think, if, if I can do that, you can do a thousand times more. But it's up to you to take the first step. Nobody can force you to take a step. It's something that you have to desire. And it all begins with you having a strong desire for Christ. And that desire for Christ begins when you truly understand what he did for you. Because take note, you can only see a tiny percentage of this reality. I think our Father is allowing all these extraordinary subjects come out. All of them are not fake. And I do suspect that in your heart of hearts, you have an understanding that some very strange and deadly things will come forward.
that it will not be conventional. It will be highly unconventional. I even suspect that you have an idea that there's some real critters on this earth that are going to do damage. Like that ancient story, the March of the Wahi or something like that. You know what that is? It's the March of the Hairy People. That's what it is. Spears and arrows cannot take them down. It is said that everything bounces off of them. That they can vanish and reappear at will. You can't destroy them. It is said that they will march across the whole of the earth and they are everywhere. Everywhere. They're everywhere. It's also said that whole armies will be taken down simply by the stench. Can you imagine something that smells so bad that they defeat an army? <laughs> that would be, that's horrible. Horrible. And if in truth, if man did encounter anything like that, they're going to take it serious, which means they need some sort of autonomous machine to confront them. They can't do it themselves. How interesting. Which means they would press for technology, for robots and things like that. Because they have an understanding they cannot engage. Flesh cannot engage those things. They have to engage them with something else. We also know in the Bible that at some point, all these people on earth are going to have a high belief in life outside of this planet, and they will attempt to destroy it and fight it as it comes. They're going to fight the angels. They're going to fight the Lord and his hosts when they come. They're going to make the last stance and attempt to fight our Father and the righteous that come with him. And they're going to fail miserably. So that means the world must be well acquainted with quite a few external things the earth would have changed by then the inhabitants of the earth will be few at that time that means there's a that's in the bible and there will be a steep decline in the population that's when the utopia comes following the calamity and if those calamities are real then men are making preparations to survive those times Maybe that's why trillions of dollars are going into nothing. They're not going into the armed services. Some of the sounds that people are hearing in the skies, like trumpets and all these, all those things, right? Do you not know that when they were digging the underground bridges or the underground tunnels, tunnel systems, that people are coming forward, the engineers with recordings of the skies and those exact noises, do you know that? Because they were digging underground. We're talking deep in the deep in the earth. We also know in 2024, places like Japan, here in America, inside those mountains that people think are so strong, they hollowed them out and put facilities inside the mountains. They're filling them up with pure water. Lots of water. And water systems. So that water can be reused. But you're talking, can you imagine a mountain full of pure water? Can you imagine that? You think they're what? Doing that for what? Just an experiment or something? These are facilities being built. Japan just started one, another one. They're hollowing out yet another mountain has been hollowed out. The mountain has been hollowed out. We're not talking about some place like Cheyenne. No, this is something that is different. Truth will come out. Mountains within the USA have been sealed as of 2022. 
They will not open ever. They're sealed as of 2022. There's no way out, no way in. The only way to get out of that place is to blow, essentially blow the hatches. So whoever's in those places have been sealed in there. Isn't it funny how in 2022 all the trending changed from in, in the activity of the earth? All this stuff happening. You don't think they know what's happening. Look at who's running the country. I don't mean, I mean no disrespect, but these are people that nobody would pick. Wouldn't you agree? You don't have much of a selection, do you? If, if a candidate came forward right now, do you not know that a lot of the country would vote for the new candidate and would not pick Biden or Trump? Do you know that? Wait till you see the outcome. You don't think something is being staged right before your eyes? Think of this scenario. So we got Trump who's controversial, right? And we know he has a following. But we have this other guy who appears to be a little frail, you know, sometimes, and it doesn't inspire a lot of confidence. Democratic and Republican conventions come out. The Republican convention comes out. People have an idea of what they think will happen. But the Democratic convention comes out. And nobody knows what, who's going to be picked because the Democrats have not essentially picked their person yet. Do you know that? So if something weird happens... Do you not realize how fast this country would adopt new leadership? Because it's a proven fact. They have, a, they have issues with the two that are being presented. So we're not talking about, we're, we're talking about somebody brand new that nobody has been talking about. You know, Biden said, He's not going anywhere, right? He's going to finish this. And, and Monday, I mean, they're doing damage control like you wouldn't believe. So Monday comes out, and everybody starts saying, well, uh, you know, the news is saying one thing. The talking head, the congressmen who are constantly in front of television, they're saying one thing. Behind the scenes, something else is happening. People are saying people frustrated angry, mad like hornets. You know where they're mad? Huh? They're mad because it's a game to them and they want to win. They just get you involved in their game. They pull at your heartstrings. You're the one that believes all of this is real. You are. You believe all of it's real. All of it. People believe all of it's real. I want you to start examining their faces. And you ask yourself, if we are in such a crisis, how could people be laughing and having a good time? Can anybody answer that? Let me tell you something. This world is in crisis. If I were in any of those positions, you would not see me smiling and laughing at everybody. How can I do that with knowledge as to what's happening? Huh? How could you sit there and laugh and smile and you know you you know what's happening in the earth? There'd be no way I'd be able to laugh and smile. And I wouldn't care who didn't see me laugh and smile. How could they sit there and be so comfortable? Be so relaxed? Something's not right. I remember Kennedy's face. You guys remember that? Some of you guys? I remember his face. He wasn't smiling. He wasn't smiling before the cameras. When he had deep concerns about the issues in America, he was not smiling. He wasn't smiling. Today I heard people, they came out and, of course, Democratic Party in support of Biden. And they said, well, you know, did you guys come to an agreement, this and the other? And they just put on this fake smile and said, I'm behind Biden all the way. That was just incredibly fake. The smile went off as soon as the camera, before the camera could pan, the smiles left. Just fake. But everybody's going to find out they've been somewhat duped. Nobody's going to go into that subject. 
it's important that everybody thinks it's absolutely real. I'm just telling you that if these were normal times, the selection that we have would not be selected. They would not be selected. Maybe some people are missing what's actually been happening. It's almost like a mockery right in people's faces. But I'll tell you this. All of you who believe in Christ, the Lord warned you not to put your faith in mankind. And many of those who believe in Christ are not listening. Now they have to live with the consequences of what they are approving. They didn't have to approve it, but they are. And no one will escape facing the consequences. Because everyone was given a chance, an opportunity, but they continue to choose mankind. The Lord told us how to identify anything, didn't he? How do you truthfully identify anything in this world? Somebody tell me. By the Lord's word, how do you identify what something really is in this world? Somebody tell me. Somebody tell me. How do you identify? How do you identify anything in this world by the word of God? Somebody tell me. Uh, that's right. You got it. You'll know a tree by its fruits. You will not know a tree by what you think the tree is. You'll not know a tree by how tall it is or how short it is, how many leaves it has or how many leaves it does not have. You'll know a tree by the fruit it yields. Look at the fruit. Let me give an example of something. Because I constantly, you know, I constantly dig up. I have a, I got a, a little thing, a little journal I keep. And I was taught to do this before going into being a policy setter. But there's a practice regarding those fruits. So the only way to not be duped in this world's game is to know what fruit had yielded in the first place. To know what the outcome has truly been, not by the news, not by ambitious members of a similar party, but to know what each of them actually did. And when you look at the fruit, first of all, all of them are yielding little tiny raisins, not even grapes or raisins. That means the fruit shriveled up. What is the greatest thing, any Democrats here, what is the greatest thing Biden has done? In truth. And, and don't repeat what you see, heard on the news. Something that you have checked the numbers on outside of institutions and with institutions. You can't just get the numbers from the institution. You can't do that. You have to get it outside and with the institution. What has he done? What has President Biden actually done? he do anything at the border? Did he? In truth, did he do anything at the border? No. He didn't. They had a master plan. They tried to get it passed. It was shot down and returned. Of course, that, that was the end of that. What did he actually do? I'll tell you what he did. He got a $35 cap on insulin. That's what he did. There it is. That's what he did. As a consequence of the Democrats, the employment numbers did rise. They did. But not because, it, it was only because these were minority jobs that were had, okay? Minority jobs. So there's a difference between outskirt minority jobs and those mainstream jobs, just so you know this. So you, somebody just can't say employment went up 11% and give you not give you what they're issued in, what demographic they're issued in. That's how they get you. You think it went up 11% across the board. It did not. 
It may go up 11% in an area that only produces 0.00002% of economy support taxes. That's negligible. You do understand that, right? Anyway, nothing done there either. Nothing done there either. I'm telling you, the only thing he did was put a cap on insulin. What about this abortion stuff that's been going on? Remember how divisive this abortion issue was and how people turn against each other? Have you been tracking both parties? You guys, you know what was overturned, right? You're about to see that that was useless to overturn because now they're going to make the overturning of that null and void. The Republicans will. They're going to make it null and void. In fact, you're about to see a U-turn in a few areas, as with all parties. If all parties do this. In other words, they tell you exactly what you want to hear. They tell you about the bills that are passed and being proposed. They don't tell you that they're struck down, that they're overruled by courts. That's what happened with the border. That's what happened with all the other plans that went forward. Sure, they passed. It does not mean they happened. And some of those things that are supposed to pass will not take effect for 15 years. They were never meant to happen during this administration or the next three. Do you know that? I told you guys, get ready for a big betrayal. I wasn't joking. And it's going to be too late once it happens. God's children are going to finally learn they cannot trust in flesh. That their trust should be absolutely in Christ. That prayer actually works. But you cannot pray in a prideful, with a prideful mouth. That's not a prayer to the Most High. Humble yourself. Reach a point of meekness and go before the Lord in truth, not pride. You don't pray to the Lord so he can do your bidding. He's not our slave. I've heard people pray, Lord, just do this in the earth and show that person how wrong they are by doing such and such. These are people who think they're, that they're giving God commands. And they're using prayer to do it. That's not some prayer. A prayer is a petition. Is it not? It's when we inquire of the Lord of something, having exhausted everything we know how to do. Not to ask God to do our filthy bidding here on this earth. We got to be careful of those things. Because these practices are all over the earth. And when people are in the truth, and you hear me close, because it will be the greatest thing you ever fought is your urge to agree with those who want to hang every past leader. The people, they will revolt. It's going to come and they're going to seek to prosecute their leaders, all of them. So the adage is true. Those that eat of a portion of his meat shall destroy him. That's an overall theme throughout the word of God. In other words, those who serve a leader will be the same ones who destroy that leader. If you're talking about party lines, then those of the same party are going to go after the leader. They're going to put all betrayal upon that leader. Keep that under your hats. Watch for it. Because right now, people will not hear it. They won't accept it. But when it happens, they're going to be broken by it. They're going to be broken. But I pray in their brokenness, they'll understand that their trust should only be in the living God. And maybe that will be enough to break them free from the trance of serving flesh and those things of flesh. 
the great upsets are coming, but you will only be upset if your faith is fully in mankind. You will not be upset if your trust and faith is in Christ Jesus. If your faith and trust is in the Lord, you'll intercede for those who messed up and for those who suffer because others messed up. Be a great asset to the kingdom during that time. But that goes for those who trust in the Most High right now. They're not trusting in men. They intercede for men, but they trust in the Most High. Even those who would serve under such, they can still do so with absolute trust in the Most High. Somebody said to break out the guillotines. It's happened before. It didn't happen here except for slavery. Right? Slavery within itself is an act of pride, is it not? It's when one race believes they're entitled over the other. And they suppress an entire race. That's evil within itself. So, of course, they're going to have evil methods in there. I'm... I have to think contrary to all guillotines. I think what will truly happen is when the people revolt against the leaders. The leaders are going to have no choice but to engage in a horrible crisis to fight off the people. When that happens, the leaders are going to be fully subdued. And the people will appoint the line they will appoint the lines the people will do that so in other words people are going to take back their power they're going to take it back they will install to themselves something that truly represents them which will be in fact an abomination on this earth they're primed for the antichrist they're going to turn on their leaders you will see it with your eyes I just pray you're not part of it. Because anybody who's part of that is going to be marked with a stain that will not go away. Hmm? Somebody said, you mean that we are not already slaves now? No, we're not. We're not. Nope, we're not. It's important that you voluntarily serve evil. See, if you're forced to serve evil, right? Then that evil must be vanquished. And if evil is vanquished, the end won't come like it's supposed to come. No, what's happening now is voluntary. People will choose to have evil things appointed over them. That's what's happening now. People are choosing to be imprisoned. Why? Because they'll sell their own souls, body, or anything else to get a meal, to have a roof over their heads for these things that protect the flesh. You know it and I know it. Everybody knows that. That's what people are doing. They're selling their souls for money because money has become the new what? Savior in the earth. Is that right or wrong? Is that right or wrong? Is money not the Savior in the earth? And isn't it funny how it's bought out about the beast? If you don't have the mark of the beast, you're not going to be able to buy or sell like buying and selling is the major thing in the earth at that time. Think about that. Huh? Buying and selling is the major thing. You know, it kind of gives you a hint of what the beast is. It's based on prosperity. It is based on buying and selling. It is based on this idea of having lots of money or money where you can be comfortable. Don't people sell themselves out? for money all day long, for comfort, for security. People have gotten married for security. They didn't love the person, but they felt secure with the person. They didn't have to. They're willing to give over themselves just to have security in another day. Are you kidding me? This is happening all over the earth. When the Antichrist comes, he'll issue a mark. And they're going to say, well, you just, can't, you just can't buy or sell if you don't have the mark, which means you will not be able to live your life in the world you want so much. Because thinking through, if somebody told me, Mike, you won't be able to buy or sell if you don't have this, I said, well, goodbye. I can go live off the land. I know how to do that. 
I know how to vanish. I know how to disappear. I know how to do quite a few things. But if you have, if that's your absolute security like this new generation, they don't know how to pick an apple off a tree. They do not. How are they going to make it? Huh? How are they going to make it? They don't know how to cook their own meals. You know they go to fast food and order through these places that deliver food, right? Even the people in the restaurants don't know how to cook. How is it that those who work in McDonald's and all these other places, they don't know how to cook? All they know is you take this packet out the freezer, throw it in that grease for so many minutes, it tells you when to take it out, put it on the plate, and, you know, and give it to somebody. If you gave them the raw ingredients, they would say, well, I need a timer. Well, this doesn't look like the equipment we have at McDonald's. Well, this isn't, it. I don't know what to do with it. Prepackaged foods, right? Most of the skill sets to sustain a person in the basics of life are lost. The average person does not know how to brush their teeth in the wild. They don't know what's dangerous and what they can or cannot do. They don't know what attracts predators and what repels them. They don't know anything. And so guess what? If they cannot buy or sell, they're effectively kicked out of society. They'll starve to death. In less than a week, they'll die. They cannot live on their own. They can't do it. Can't do it. And the conditions are such now, right, that a person will not be able to make it outside of a protected city given a certain time. They're going to use chemical weapons one day and it's going to contaminate the land. There goes the water situation. That means if you don't have stored water that are in mountains away from all chemicals and everything else. The water is going to be so contaminated you will not be able to drink it. In fact, the Bible tells us that, that many men died because the waters were made bitter. It's telling you that the waters of the earth are going to be poison. No wonder they're storing water in the mountains. They have an expectation of these biblical things coming to pass, which is why they hid themselves from the wrath of the Lamb. They knew about the wrath of the Lamb, so they hid themselves, didn't they? They said, for the day of his great wrath has come, who shall be able to stand? So they already knew about it. That means they're making preparations right now. And they're doing it at breakneck speed. And with all the populace of the earth, they're playing games. They're just occupying you. They're giving you everything you need to stay engaged in that chess game while they prepare to live. You're playing a chess game, their game, where neither side is victorious. Huh? Man, listen to me. Before anybody fixates on all those rest of those components, this whole story is about your salvation. Because see, so many people have focused on these other folks, they have forgotten about their own salvation. None of you should be moved by anything of what I'm saying. None of you should be surprised because these things are scriptures, in scripture. All of you right now should not be slaves to these systems in the earth. The Lord has made multiple ways of escape out of any sinful situation you've been in. And everybody knows it. I know it's a bold statement. But you all know out there the Lord's made a way of escape out of that situation you're stuck in. And instantly, you know what you said to yourself? Well, how will I make it? You did not exercise your faith. God will have you take a step first. And after you take a step and commit to it, he, by his power, he'll walk in you. He'll finish the walk, and then he'll show you why and how he'll do things. He won't show you anything up front. He'll simply say, come follow me. You've got to make it up in your mind what you're going to do. We still, you still have this moment. You can make a difference. You may have thrown in the towel. 
yesterday or right before this broadcast or even a few minutes ago. You do not have to throw in the towel another moment. You can make the changes. You know the changes that have to be made. You can make those changes. See, every day the Lord does not come. It's considered a new start day for you. But those days will not always be on anybody who has truly entered in and decides to walk out. That's very unsafe because there's no guarantee you're going to come back. These are, these are the days of the falling away. These are the days that God gives people over to a reprobate mind. If God gives you over to a reprobate mind, you will not come back. You're lost. If God decides you're done for, you're done for. You hear me? If God gives you over to a reprobate mind, you're not coming back to any point of salvation. You're not. So the opportunity is now. And it's important that you soberly consider your next move. For some reason, people have forgotten the consequence of sin. They have. They're walk, living their lives as though no matter what they do, God will forgive them. If that were true, nobody would fall away. Isn't that right? If that were true, if you were once saved for all time, no one would fall away. There'd be no reason for Jesus to give a caution to those who live in the end times. He gave great caution. Great ones. He said, don't let offenses, errors in the word of God work through you. That's all these theories. Don't let them work through you and cause somebody else to stumble. Then he say that. In fact, those who continue to read Thessalonians, they know the one famous part. You ready? And God will send them a strong delusion that they would believe a lie, that they all might be damned who loved not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. If you have pleasure in unrighteousness, you're going to be given over to a strong delusion by the living God of which you will not escape. God will send them a strong delusion. If It's not the devil tricking you. It is God sending you a strong delusion that you will believe a lie. And for what reason? That they all might be damned who loved not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Those are people without repentance. If you have pleasure in unrighteousness, you didn't repent. You didn't have a heart of repentance. You see how that works? People are really going to be lost this way. They're really going to be lost this way. And there's no need for that. See, that's very disturbing to me. To know that people are going to fall away. Somebody said, are they tares? Well, didn't the Lord have a little story about the withered wheat? Hmm? Didn't he give a caution about a person withering up? Didn't he? I think he did. So these are people who have a choice. But they let the darkness win. They gave in to flesh. And those who give in will be eternally separated from the living God. And those who are eternally separated never belong to him in the first place. Huh? So some people become tears, willingly. They had an opportunity, but failed, didn't they? Just like the fallen angels were assigned a position, but they fell. Just like Satan was assigned to be a covering cherub, but he fell. If God spared not the angels... He's not going to spare any of us who fall away either because of our unbelief. Why is that so important?
because God put the belief in you. And the only way to be an unbeliever like that is to deny it. Satan saw it and he denied it. And he rebelled against it. The fallen angels chose to rebel against it. The truth was putting you. But you too have freedom of choice. Because in the end Christ will say, Depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. Back to that question about the tares. That means people are going to be discovered. Now listen to me. I'll also tell you that people who are tares, they don't speak about forgiveness at all. They do. They do. They do. They do speak about judgment. They will not speak about forgiveness. You can't speak about judging somebody and forgiveness at the same time. Because to judge somebody is to not forgive them. And to forgive someone is not to judge them. In the book of Jude, it said they're found in your feasts of charity. They're ordained to be ungodly men. They're ordained to be ungodly men. Everything they do and every practice they have and ungodliness surfaces. Clouds without water. Twice dead, fucked up by the roots. Hmm? To be in your feasts of charity is to be in your... A feast is a gathering where you give things, where everybody partakes of something, right? So a feast of charity is when everybody partakes of what? Of love, because charity is love itself. Is this not a gathering of love? This is not forced. This is in the basis of love itself. You know, it's written that God is love. So we're gathered because of our Father, a feast of charity where everybody can partake of God's love. They're right here with us. They're in your they're spots in your feasts of charity. Spots. These are the folks that bring up things, anything they can, right? To try and divert, take away from whatever topic is being inspired. They do things like that. They're spots. They cast doubt. They cause people to question. They'll get your mind on questioning everything. And off the word of God, so much so you're consumed by what they're saying. They are perfect at that. They do it all the time. And they're found among us, not outside of us. So where are the tares at? They're right here with us. That's where they are. They're among you. They will always speak to you to attempt to get you to agree with them. And if they can engage you, because the Bible says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Well, if you resist the devil, you're not going to speak to him. You're not going to engage him. You're not doing that. Once you engage him, you're losing. You're losing. Once you engage him, you're losing. These are people who never change. Have you ever met a person who never changes? It seems like they're on the edge of belief, but they can't believe, and they're like this for years, and they even die in that state. And they slowly but surely speak against every practice and principle of Jesus Christ, casting doubt upon everything, causing people to doubt also. I kind of like those people on History Channel when they said, well, Jesus didn't really die. He just covered up the fact that he had a family. See, the same thing. Now, that thought did not enter into people's heads. But when they said that, it causes a person to entertain that. And then it fights against their faith. So these are the ones that say, well, you know, I heard that, you know, and they come up with all sorts of stuff. To support love itself is to also speak the words of truth from Jesus Christ. But that's not what they do. They don't speak the truth of Jesus Christ. They cast doubt upon anything they can. They'll always be among, among us, always. And you have to learn to see them. Right? See them for who they are. That's all. 
Once you see them, they're ineffective. But take note, others will be utilized also. In your moment of weakness, they can use you. They can. Any infraction and a door is open within you for them. And they will utilize you against other people. They will get a hold of your mind. They will send you spiraling out of control. Hmm? Somebody said, so is it possible to identify them? Yes. They do not speak of forgiveness. They don't talk about forgiveness, ever. They'll steer the conversation away from forgiveness every single time. They hate the topic of forgiveness. They love the topic of blame. Assigning blame. They're experts at that. They are. And they're always among us. Always. Folks, that's all I have for you tonight. I'm going to say God bless each of you. Listen, I'm going to see you guys tomorrow right here at the Council of Time. I will. And we're going to get it ordered in this place. Any updates on the tsunami warnings? No. No. No, we'll line all that out. We still have time. I have a good, uh, I have a good sense of timing with certain things. Not everything, just certain things. And I trust the timing given to me. We still have time. Listen, we had to be cautious with that info, too. And very careful and responsible, highly responsible. Those subjects make me nervous by way of presentation, right? Because uh, I don't want to do anything that will take away from anybody else's quality of fellowship, right? If I make a wrong move, the whole site could suffer, right? And if that happens, that's on my hands. I don't want that to happen. I do not want that to happen. Folks, God bless and keep you. Listen, I may be in the chat room here shortly. I may be. I've got to post some things to our site here and get back working on it. And do the best I can with this. Um, we, I'm so nervous about posting. We're having something looked over before it posts anyway. It's being looked over. It's been combed through. So that means before you guys get some serious stuff, it is going to be looked over to make sure I'm in compliance with uh, several things. Then it will be posted, okay? Had to have that looked over. I'm being led in that direction, and so that's precisely what I did. We'll do that subject by subject, right? Just do me a favor. Don't make a big deal when you do see things. Don't make a big deal. Just if you can use it, great. If you can't, no big deal, right? But let people also discover it. Can you do that? Let them discover it, find it, trip over it, do whatever they can. So as soon as that 3C363 helped to get in my account, I saw, and you sent the email a few times back then, right? I'm getting to the emails, and evidently, guys, part of the POP server assignments were redirecting emails in the inbox to several locations I was unaware of. They were all on the system. They were just in places that, that were not accounted for. And so I am reassigning where these uh, inbound emails go so that I can actually, you know, see, and that means we were getting them, but I wasn't necessarily seeing the headers uh, for those messages. So I probably missed quite a few. We get on average um, about every hour 600 emails per hour, right? And a lot of those come are, are prompts from, you know, different things to the website. When you guys reset your passwords, we get about, we get at least 300 of those uh, a day. Password resets, <laughs> just password resets. So we get that per day. Uh, we get other account-related things probably about another 600 times per day. And we get the personal emails, that's in the, that's a lot. We get them from all over the place. And then you have your junk mail and all that stuff you have to deal with. So it's a lot to comb through. And there's a strategy we're going to have to use to get to it. And some people are cruel. Some people try to bombard your email with these iterated messages that say the exact same thing constantly throughout the day. So the pop server is always working, right? Um, I'll give you an example. We're always probed. And anytime COT, they find out about a COT account, 
it is, uh, you know, spoofed and everything else, and people send everything to it, right? They'll send everything to it and then attempt to shut it down. They do it all the time. This is all the time, right? They try to do the site the same way. They try to overwhelm it uh, with multiple sign-ins and all sorts of things. This is on a constant basis they do this. And so they're... they're there's strategies I have to use to overcome these things. And you can overcome them, and so they, they're overcome, right? People try to sneak into the chat room to mess it up, too. And you have to, you know, you're, you're, you, you just have to do things, in, in a lot of cases, spiritually, or you're just going to be stuck because nobody can read through. Today, we got 18,000 emails, 18,000 now, but they're not, some of those are just, let me give an example of this. Let me see. Let me see the real. 36,428 emails right? came through since this broadcast started. That's an example of what happens. Now, all of them are not, they're just not, you know, all of them are not legitimate. They're not. So take all that into, an, into account. We'll get all that squared away. That's a huge job. Right? And if I, one day I got stuck reading emails all day and I couldn't develop anything for the site, right? So, and I'm still giving the brick and mortar. We, we have that project going, right? My gift to you all, I'm getting all this done for you guys. I'll tell you what though, God is gracious because some of you really moved. You really moved to really watch after COT. We have our moments when things fall off to nothing. We do. And, um, but I think some of you will be comfortable when the financial page is up there. You will. It may be hard for you guys to believe, but hopefully you're comfortable with it. Also, also, some of you guys are going to be helping out in some of the foreign things that we do. Right? Some of the um, international things we do. We're going to get you guys set up, so because uh, I think uh, Splash and... Bear and them when they find out about the international moderations, they may have to oversee and help people out learn some of the new tool sets. That's going to be a lot. That's going to require at least 60 people just to do that. 60 people. Listen, the 60 people have to be spirit filled. They have to be led by the spirit in what they do. They can't, you, if you're going to be a moderator, you can't be a haphazard moderator that's emotionally moved over every single comment. That won't work. That will not work. Okay, it, we have to do all things by the spirit of truth here. All things. Nothing because somebody was offended. Nothing because somebody thought somebody was this, that, and the other. No, we, everything by the spirit of truth. That's extremely important. And, and that requires a lot. So anyway, that's where we are. Folks, listen, I'm going to see you guys next time right here at the Council of Time. God bless each of you guys. I'm going to have to shut down. Mixler is going to start back up so you guys on Mixler can chat a little bit more. But it will shut down for about 10 minutes. Okay. You guys be blessed. Uh, the music will shut down too. Okay. So there will be no music coming on there. So everybody be blessed. God blessed. I'll see you guys next time. Right here at COT.